This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, this is Hallie Alexander from Wake Forest University, and today I'm here with Anto Bogic from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Anto is a member of the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, or the NAEC, which is the governing body that designates the levels of epilepsy centers and makes sure that all the centers are meeting the regulations. Anto and his group have used the data collected from the 2019 annual report of 206 adult epilepsy center directors and 136 pediatric epilepsy center directors across the U.S. to evaluate trends in epilepsy surgery. And the results are published in Neurology in a paper titled Association Between Characteristics of National Association of Epilepsy Centers and the Reported Utilization of Specific Surgical Techniques. So, Anto, thank you so much for joining us today. You are welcome, Hallie. I'm pleased to be with you. So tell us then, what did you find in terms of how does epilepsy surgery practice differ across the U.S.? Well, on the background of great underperformance as a field, epilepsy surgery field, ours is the first study revealing additional regional discrepancies. I'm sure you would agree with me that you would grade us as underperformers since we eventually evaluate and possibly treat maybe every 10th patient who could benefit from non-pharmacologic treatments of epilepsies. Absolutely. I agree with you there. We're definitely underutilizing epilepsy surgery in general all across the U.S. Now, were there regional differences that you found in terms of different locations using different surgical practices? Yes, definitely. That's the novelty of our study. So what we found basically that there are regional variations, how various means of non-pharmacologic treatments are utilized. For instance, one thing that came on the radar is utilization of laser interstitial thermal therapy, known as a LIT, in the south as opposed to Midwest and Northeast. This, of course, is not to say that there is an overutilization of LIT in the south. This simply means that compared to the treatment utilization in Midwest and Northeast, South is doing more. We do not know exactly in reality how many people could benefit from this treatment. Were there any other regional differences that you found in surgical procedures other than the laser ablation? Yes, definitely. Perhaps what is worth highlighting, even for laser ablation, when we looked, more centers on the West were likely to offer lit yet they perform less lit than centers in the South. This is just additional subtlety to all of this. But uh, differences were also significant when it comes to utilization of a vagal nerve stimulator known as VNS or responsive neurostimulator known as RNS. So when it comes to VNS, for instance, odds of being offered VNS in Northeast were lower than in South. And also treatment rates in Midwest and West were higher than in the South when it comes to VNS. When it comes to RNS, it was most likely to be offered in the West and treatment rates were higher in West and Midwest. Also, what came on the radar is that, for instance, odds of performing hemispherotomy or hemispherectomy were nearly four times greater in the Midwest compared with South. On the other hand, as I stated, centers in the West had about twice higher rate of RNS implantation when compared to South. There are more subtle differences in using various potentially curative or palliative procedures that we study, but these are just the main highlights. Yeah, so that's really interesting, all the differences that you found, not just in the treatments, but even the offering of these devices. So what do you think could be playing into this? Is it, you know, a certain center 
that's driving some of the regional differences? Is it more related to the device companies and where they're located? Or what do you think is driving some of these variations across the regions? Well, that's a great question to which we would like also to know a complete answer and that and we don't. This study gleaned some associations, including already emphasized regional differences. But also there were educational, for instance, uh, if greater number of epileptologists with at least two years of fellowship training were present in a given center, they were more likely to do certain things. Of course, there were differences in center level and type, but these are expected differences. You know, we know that level four centers, especially in academic institutions, are better prepared to handle most complex cases of epilepsies. Also, of course, we know that certain procedures are more befitting for pediatric population. Therefore, of course, those differences came up on, on, on the radar. Now, the industry factor certainly deserves, in my opinion, a befitting scrutiny, particularly when it comes to implantable devices that I mentioned, since some practitioners and potentially patients may be influenced by their assertive agenda at times. But neither industry nor insurance landscape, for instance, were captured in this study and remain to be addressed in the future. Yeah, so now that we understand some of these regional differences, uh, it sounds like the next step is to try to understand exactly what's influencing everything. But we still don't know who's doing the right amount of what, if anyone. And that's because we don't really have a standard set of guidelines for epilepsy surgery. So do you think that's something that we will ever have, a kind of standard algorithm for how to work up a surgical patient for epilepsy? Yes, definitely. But this is just the beginning of conversation. We must dissect what we exactly mean by that. For instance, we already have a perfectly evidence-supported guidelines a practice parameter regarding a threshold for referrals for pre-surgical evaluation since 2003. Yet, a follow-up study revealed that it didn't change referral pattern. In short, just existence of clinical practice guidelines does not change a practice, and we must not wait for them before we start working on improving what is inadequate or suboptimal. If you are talking about clinical practice guidelines reflective of the exact composition of pre-surgical evaluation and uh, ensuing treatment, a degree of challenge is much bigger because of the interplay of multiple factors, including uh, heterogeneity of epilepsies. Yet, <laughs> guidelines will be our reality. Additional elements must not be forgotten, such as physician factor and patient factor. Physicians have preferences and their autonomy, and patients have preferences and their autonomy. And these two factors will never be eradicated, obviously, and shouldn't be eradicated, particularly when it comes to uh, patients' preferences. So, uh, this is a long way of saying it is rather complex, but yes, the guidelines are increasing part of our um, uh, clinical reality and this trend will only continue. So how does this impact the care then for the general neurologist today? So for example, you know, we kind of talked about the need to make referrals for epilepsy surgery earlier according to to the guidelines because we're still not referring people for epilepsy surgery early enough. There's still a delay. But the new data that your study adds, how do you think that should impact the care that neurologists are delivering in the clinic now? In my humble opinion, all of us, including general neurologists, should be primarily concerned about an early referral to an epilepsy center for an evaluation of medication-resistant epilepsy. We usually say drug-resistant epilepsy, but new trend is to use term medication. So I will use MRE for short as opposed to more colloquial DRE. Since failure of medications is predictable, there is no mystery there. We have data. So 
our first goal, all of us, we must prevent and or reduce a limitless burning of the brain cells and reduction of the limited brain reserve. In other words, the first goal should be a timely referral because really, particularly drug or medication-resistant epilepsy requires treatment within epilepsy center by a sub-specialized neurologist that we call epileptologist. Getting back to the second part of your question, I would like to believe that an epileptologist's recommendation would not be constrained with what they can offer locally, but rather guided by the patient's best interest. And this may mean a referral to another epilepsy center which is better prepared to address given patient's needs. But again, a failure to refer timely is a really fundamental, unfortunately, shared fallacy that has predictable, drastic, and irreparable consequences. I agree. And so I'll just summarize then again for the listeners, just in case that for a patient to have medically refractory epilepsy, they have to fail to control their seizures with two anti-seizure medication trials of appropriately chosen medications at therapeutic doses. And once that's achieved, that's when they are officially termed the medication refractory epilepsy. And at that point, you're saying before trying any other medications or anything, that's the point when they need to be referred to a level three or four epilepsy surgical center. We know when patient fails these two trials of appropriately selected and administered anti-seizure medications, their chance with all other permutations, on average, chance for treatment, seizure control, complete seizure control with medication is not higher than 5%. And this is the reason why we advocate, why guidelines propel, you know, this trigger point. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And we do know that epilepsy surgery earlier on leads to better outcomes in, across multiple domains. Absolutely. We know, you know, exactly that. What, what we have actually, maybe it's worth bringing up, we have 15 to 20 years a delay from diagnosis of epilepsy to referral to an epilepsy center for an evaluation of medication-resistant epilepsy. This is an outrageous delay knowing that resistance can be established within a year or two, depends on case and situation. Yeah, and so that delay is entirely too long, for sure. Uh, definitely too long. We, uh, what's important, it requires disproportionately higher investment of resources to treat these patients Yet, return on investment is much lower. So this is double loss, if you will. Yeah, so that's a great reminder for today then for everyone to remember to refer patients with medically refractory epilepsy to an epilepsy center as soon as possible without delay. Again, I've been speaking with Anto Bagic about a recent publication that he and his group put out, which was published in Neurology, titled Association Between Characteristics of National Association of Epilepsy Centers and Reported Utilization of Specific Surgical Techniques. And you can find that full article in the February 14th issue of Neurology or online at neurology.org. This is Stacy Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening and for letting us join you on your commute while you're exercising or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.